What I want to do for the, uh, for, for the next 20 minutes is talk a bit about, well, three things. I want to remind us very, very quickly of what this challenge is and why I've decided at this stage, um, certainly for the rest of my career, I'm going to work on this. And for those of my colleagues from the AEF are here, now what George has told you, it's seven years you've got to put up with me, it looks like. Anyway, um, why this is still the issue, and in my, my view, this gap is the profound issue of our generation of teachers and educators. Um, why I think evidence might be one of the things that will help us out of it. I don't think it's going to be solved by just throwing some more money or by more compliance or a tweak of the accountability framework. Well, I think evidence is going to be fundamental to the solution. I'm going to share with you very quickly a tool that you'll probably know very well. I'm going to skip over it very quickly that presents the evidence to you just one way. And then I'm going to introduce, I think, something about school improvement and what it means in terms of school improvement models when you go at it through an evidence lens. And I'm going to do that now in 18 minutes. But anyway, let's see. I'm not going to spend long on this slide. You know this very well. The gap, the, the attainment of children who just happen to come from families uh, with less wealth. Why is it in our education system that the wealth of your family has such a strong determinant on education attainment? Why is that more true of a child born in England than it is of a child born in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Germany, in Denmark, in all sorts of places? I didn't say United States of America, by the way. Um, what, 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 why is that true? Here are three ages, three points over three years, and you can see how this gap um, persists. This is the size of the gap we're seeing at the end of each of these lines in attainment. So at the end of at the end of when we're at, when we're at five in the, in, in the foundation stage profile, we've got this gap of 20%. We've got this gap at the end of key stage two of 20%. We've got this gap at the end of GCSEs at 27%. Now, three things about the gap quickly in England that are quite interesting is in England, when you look at the schools, there is a gap, our, our gap is bigger than most. Not only within our schools we have bigger gaps, we also have bigger gaps between our schools. The, the, the high-performing education in, in systems in the world, and we want to be a high-performing education system, we want to be a successful country, I guess, in all sorts of ways, the high-performing systems have narrow gaps within and between their schools. They have more equity. Um, and in fact, uh, and this is for anyone who's, many of us came to education for social justice drovers, I think, as well as our care and devotion to children, is that to be a great education system, you have to have equity. They go hand in hand. You can't leave a group of children behind for any reason and create an elitist education system that is, that is wonderful. It doesn't work like that. You need to narrow these gaps. They create a drag and a lag. The second issue, I think, is that when you look at this, not at the national averages, but at the school level, there is hope. Because in every single community, in every type of school, if you look at it by eligibility of free school meals, there are schools where the children on free school meals outperform the national average for all children. So if you're a school below 5% free school meals, if you're a school above 60% free school meals, in every family of schools, there are fellows in our, and many of them are sat here, where the free school meal children do better than the average for all children. Um, in fact, it's one in eight secondary schools where that, where that is the case. So the question is, what can we learn from those schools that have found a way of tackling this issue and meeting the needs of these children. So that gives me, that, that gives me enormous hope. And, and the third thing, you know, that doesn't need to be said, that this is not just a kind of, this isn't a policy challenge, this is a social challenge, this is a moral challenge to close this gap. Uh, because it's something which, uh, until we do, how can we rest? The final thing I'd say about this as well is, when I started teaching in the 80s, 30 years ago, in the East End of London, one thing that jumped out at me at that point, and you'll know this, those people who were there at the time, is the performance of children who spoke English as another language was absolutely pitiful. It was an, an, a, a sort of shame on us as educators. Now look at the turn in that group of children. They now, on average, as you know, outperform English-only speaking children. I believe what happened in the 80s was there was a professional turn to that challenge. We turned to it and we faced it as a profession. Uh, now, because the accountability framework is getting itself in the right place to help us with this issue, I hope there will be a professional turn to this issue, to meeting the needs of these children. We know that um, just throwing more money at the problem isn't going to be the solution. In fact, in real terms, capita spend, English education, since 2001, we've received 47% more funding per child. We've, we've lived, actually... Those of us in the last 20 years, I hate to say it, I think we've lived in a golden age of funding for education. 
I can't see it coming in the next, in the next 10 years. I think the cool chill of austerity is going to come sweeping through schools as the moment it's sweeping through places like town halls or housing, whatever, um, because we're not facing a period of growth. Now, throwing more money we know won't solve this problem, but you do need sufficient, obviously, uh, that, that, that's key. So if it's not going to be money, because in that same period, by the way, where we've grown by 47%, our actual performance, notwithstanding last night's publications on the Key Stage 2 test or what they'll say about GCAs, if you take our actual performance using things like international studies or item studies or people like chem studies in Durham, it hasn't changed that much. And certainly the gap isn't closing as fast as it should. So if it's not just money, what will help us solve this problem? My, you know, my contention this morning is going to be that the better use of evidence about what works in education. Ev education does have, there is a great deal of evidence in our business. Um, there is good, solid, quantitative evidence, not usually from this country, from abroad. There's great qualitative studies done in this country. There is evidence of very variable quality, but there is evidence. What there is, though, is an enormous gap between the generation of evidence and giving teachers access to and tools to put that evidence to work. You know, my flippant point is that apart from the fact that researchers are writing about things that don't matter to us and they're writing in a language that we don't read and they're publishing it in journals we don't read, it's all fine. Apart from that, the trouble is that it's a complete chasm between the generation of evidence and the business of teaching. So what we're trying to do is find ways of bridging those two, those two communities. I don't blame either one. I think it's a collective. We should take responsibility or we should all take responsibility for it. And we're trying to bridge those two communities. One way is by synthesizing what we know. These are the meta studies. These are the things like the toolkit, the teaching learning toolkit, which I hope you've heard of. We know many thousands of schools go to and people use now. That just provides access to evidence. And later on today, there's a workshop led by my colleague, Robbie Coleman and Lee Elliott Major, who are going to present that to you in more detail if you're interested. There's lots of caveats about working on averages. It's very worrying. And it's great to see people using the toolkit. Then you kind of want to get under the table when you realize that some people are using it in a rather crass and crude way. So the great example, I'll just pull one out, would be teaching assistants. You've heard this news about the toolkit saying, on average, teaching assistants make very little difference to children's progress. But on that, under that average is enormous range. And the, the implication isn't that you sack teaching assistants. The implication is that you get hold of the research and you find out what's happening in the schools where you've got very positive progress and you make that happen in your school. That's the implication. Because it is about the deployment, the training, the development of people. Because when they are working very effectively, you can have high effect. Uh, and I've, I worry very much about the evidence being read in a kind of crude way. I know you wouldn't do that, but that is important uh, because you can see politicians just jumping on it happily. So the better use of evidence, I think, is, 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 is one of the solutions. In the end, the evidence takes you to no more than this, and this is absolutely central to your mission and who you are as an organization. It takes you to this. You have to, it takes you to think harder and deeper about the business of teaching and learning. What I'm finding most fascinating about this at the moment in this new role after, and it is a luxury, is that I just get to talk about, again, how do children learn? The most fascinating subject of all. I get into that every day. We have a conversation about that, which I find really interesting, as well as about why haven't we done other things, but we're not get to that. Now, if evidence can help, the question is, if you present it passively to the system through websites, nobody can be naive enough to believe that will make the world change. That isn't going to happen. We have to then take the evidence and ask the question, how do I put it to work in a school? Because uh, education, of course, is organized in these, these, these fascinating units, these places called schools where we spend so much of our life. Um, and how do things happen in those places? Well, they happen in those places because as a leader, as a teacher, you have in your head, I guess, a model of school improvement. You have a theory about how my school changes or a theory about how my learning changes. And all this slide is, is a question, or really it's a set, up a set of questions. Should we be thinking differently about the process of school improvement if we want it to be driven by evidence? Um, I, 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 I'm gonna, I'd like to suggest that what we've had in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of nodding and not so much knowing. The nodding is about uh, we have been enthralled by the accountability framework how do I keep myself just the right side of the Ofsted inspection? 
How do I get my just the right number of kids across the line of the floor targets or thresholds to get me out of danger? And that is completely understandable because the systems become completely obsessed with accountability as the way of making you a great education system or a great school. And my belief is it can take you so far, but it cannot take you all the way. What takes you all the way is a deep understanding about how children learn and about how schools get to be better places. So I do worry that what we're seeing with, say, the pupil premium, which I'm a massive fan of, is a kind of slight in government belief that if we just got the accountability framework right, we could deal with this gap. And it's not about that. It's about us gripping it, professional said earlier, and understanding what it is for these children that makes a difference in their learning. So we know a lot about that first step. We know a lot about how do we use data. We've never seen so much data and information about our children and schools as we have now. We're, we are a profession rich in data at very detailed levels. Um, I don't think we should lose sight, though, that the internal data has to be coupled with the values and the professional judgment. Values are central to education, and we must hold on to the values of our school and ourselves as teachers. The second step is from an analyzing what the question is in my school, which we don't always do. A, a joke I borrowed from somebody else is we've got lots of iPads running around schools, which is an answer without a question. Um, but once we get the right question, we might then turn on and say, how can we use the evidence that's available? Great examples. How can we use evidence in order to work out what might be the best possible solution for our school? We select then um, a kind of an option. We go for something. And then this third step, I think, is really interesting. Once you've made a decision about the... Um, about the, the, the application or the program or the change or the knowledge you're bringing into bear in your school, how do you give it the best chance of success? I think quite often we might have found an idea, dropped it into the school, and then turned later on and said, you know what, it didn't work. Look at it, it's not working. And rather than asking ourselves, have we really given it the best chance for success? Have we done all the professional development that gives the teachers the new strategies and approaches to bring that to bear? Have we strategically moved our resources to make sure we're giving that the chance to be successful? Have we understood its detail and really got behind a bit of the research to understand what the components are rather than the headline reading the cover of the box and not get into the guts of it? We really need to know if we're going to give things the best chance of success. And then once we've given it the best chance of success, did it work? we really evaluate? Now, we've developed a tool on our website, and, and, and Robbie's here, he can talk to you about this much better than I can, which allows you to conduct your own do-it-yourself evaluation, a sort of randomization at our own school, a rigorous study, rather than did we like it or not, or rather than hearing from the science department, we didn't like it, did we? No, it's too much work. You've got to move the kids around. You've got to, no, we didn't like it. Did it really work for our children? And then if you go through that process, my view is that it gives you, at the final step, it gives you some massive authority as a school to say, we, went for, we found a problem, we found a solution, we gave it the very best chance for success, we've evaluated it properly, and it worked. Now, this is the way we do things here. It gives you the authority that isn't based on your will, your charisma, your fear factor. It gives you an authority that's based on deep professional evidence. I think quite often we go from step one to step two, a head or someone might come in. I've done this. I put my hand up. I think I know what the answer is. Now I'm going to make you all do it. We go straight to step five. I'm going to will this into the institution rather than take people on a process which reveals and transparently says this is why we do it. So it's not only this is the way we do things here, which I think you do need in a school, a consistent approach, but it's this is why this is the way we do things here. It creates an authority which isn't about an individual, it's an authority that's about evidence, which I think is much more authentic and much more professional way to treat us. Now, unless we believe in models like this and believe in the application of evidence, both the disciplined innovation, let's not be surprised that others in our nation, whether they're policy makers, politicians, whatever, will quite happily keep telling us what to do. Because if it isn't rooted in evidence, what is it rooted in? It's rooted in my kind of, I can shout louder than you. I own, I've got this that I can wave about. You know, the mantra needs to be in the future when someone has a new idea about changing what children should learn or what words they should spell now politicians decide when children are seven. 
The mantra from us should be, show me the evidence. That's how we reclaim, I think, this profession uh, from what I think is a terrible drift to it just being held in the vagaries of who happens to be in charge at certain minutes of time of certain organs of government. Not only do we need to build and use evidence in our own schools, um, it's great to tell you that there are well over a thousand schools in this country that are working with you and for you right now, and many of you in the room. Uh, we're lucky in the EF, we've been, we will be spending, and I know it, 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 it's an enormous amount of money, we'll be spending well over 200 million pounds in the next 12 years finding out more about what works. And we do that by commissioning studies and by evaluating. And we've got 53 of these studies underway now in a thou over 1,000 schools with over 300,000 children. All sorts of questions, and I've just, there are three of them thrown up here. What's the benefit of going to school on a Saturday morning? We've got this quite easy knee jerk. Do you know what? If the kids aren't learning, let's just make the school day longer. Let's give them more of the same. It's a risk, I think, but anyway. Uh, so let's find out for sure. So we're running a big randomized trial up in Manchester to find out what is the benefit. And the randomized bit's hard for us as teachers. We had all these children who want to go to school on a Saturday morning. We have to say, OK, yes, no, yes, no. Don't worry, it's not no forever. You can go next year. But we have to randomize. We have to randomize from the willing. We've got too much in education in England where what we do is we, we compare the willing, people who want it, with everybody else. In fact, you have to compare with like, otherwise you're not going to get a fair test. What's the, what's the benefit of learning to play a musical instrument when you're young? I know what my intuition is. I know what people who have money do. Let's find out if this is valuable for children, really, in a controlled way. And if it is, well, then we can scale that and be, begin to encourage more schools to do that. What's the, what's the benefit of improving teaching by using models like lesson study from Korea and Japan and wherever, where teachers work in trios and observe each other's lessons? How do you observe a lesson to give someone to improve teaching, not only rate teaching? Uh, we're working with many of you, and the one that you would want to see on there, we're working with you to close the gap with Challenge Partners. We've got 130-odd schools uh, working now around the country in trios. We're trying to find out, is that a way of raising attainment? And what's interesting about that, we're not just doing that. We're evaluating that in a rigorous way to be able to come back to you and say, do you know what, that was great work, and this is the difference it made or didn't make. Uh, and I think it's a testament to you that you've come into that. So there's no shortage of innovation in our schools today. But the history, I think, of our system is that it's strewn with good intentions that just turn out to be red herrings or wither away, and we don't see them through. Um, it's, I'm absolutely convinced it's worth putting much more effort into making innovations work and testing them through, uh, th through, through rigorous research. And if it's successful, then our challenge is to spread it and move it around the system through organizations like yourself, which is what you're about, which is why it's so good to be here. This is an authentic organization of teachers moving knowledge around and learning together, which is wonderful. This is all about innovation for its a purpose, not innovation for its own sake. So just to conclude, I think therefore my implications are we must start from what we know and understand the research that underpins our business, and we'll talk more about that in the workshop. We must put energy into evaluation, and it's not easy, it's hard. And we must focus on making innovation stick um, rather than letting them wither. I hope that's enough to get us going for a conversation. Thank you very much, everybody.